Stanford University. So today's session is on smart cities and urban mobility, reshaping transportation systems, autonomous mobility, infrastructure readiness, and safety regulations. We have a fantastic group of panelists who span from academia to industry and finance and operations. Would love for them to go ahead and introduce themselves first. And if they don't do a good enough job bragging about their impressive accomplishments, I'll be adding some color to that. So why don't we start off with John from Hyundai? Do you wanna go ahead and start by introducing yourself? Sure, sure. Hi everybody, my name is John Sa and I'm uh, Vice President and uh, Founding Director of uh, Hyundai Cradle. Cradle is actually a network of four offices, part of Hyundai Motor Group's corporate venturing and open innovation activity. We have offices in Beijing, Berlin, Tel Aviv, and Silicon Valley. And that's where I'm based, and that's the office that, that I manage. I also lead a new team called the New Horizon Studio. Uh, just formed in the first quarter of this year, and our mission is to uh, pioneer the development of vehicles with novel architectures, um, mostly ground vehicles, um, looking at combining technologies in unique ways to, to, to address um, some interesting opportunities for new future customers and uh, their needs. My back, by way of background, I, I um, have a, uh, my master's and PhD from Stanford in mechanical engineering. I spent a lot of time at the Center for Integrated Systems, doing a lot of work in uh, MEMS research. And before that, I was uh, an electrical engineering uh, undergrad at a small school in, um, in Flint, Michigan. I've been with Hyundai for almost nine years at this point. And uh, let's see, hopefully that was a good enough intro to myself. I'll, 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 pa I'll pause there. Great, thank you, John. Lori, do you wanna introduce yourself next? Sure. Hi there, I'm Lori Yoler. I am a uh, general partner at a venture capital firm in Palo Alto called Playground Global that invests in deep technology in a variety of areas. We uh, look at automation, robotics, and AI very broadly. We look at next generation computing. Uh, we look at healthcare and biotech and automation and logistics and even infrastructure. So really deep tech that is not something that's a short-term incremental addition, but really something that can have multi-generational impact. So we have about, uh, let's see, about 850 million under management. We do mostly series A rounds and uh, we have about 50 portfolio companies. So that is my day job, but I also serve on uh, quite a number of boards and have throughout my career, I have been an entrepreneur, an executive, and an investor throughout my career. I am probably best known for being the first investor and board member at Tesla and served that company for over 10 years, both as an advisor and a board member. More recently, I am on the board and was a very uh, involved strategic advisor to Zooks in the autonomy space. And I was also a president at Qualcomm where smart cities and mobility and robotics were key areas that I looked at and had teams that were both focused on building product and solutions, but also partnering with others. And we also made investments and acquisitions. I'm also on the board of Bose. So I hope you all have Bose headphones. And I'm on the board of Church and Dwight, which is a consumer packaged goods company uh, in New Jersey that competes with Procter & Gamble and Clorox. And I'm on the board here locally of the Computer History Museum and involved with AI for All, which was started at Stanford, Fei-Fei Li's uh, AI group. And then I'm on the board of uh, some small companies, one in logistics called Leaf Logistics in New York and another called Branch here uh, in Silicon Valley. Great, thank you, Laurie. And last but not least, we have Juan, who's um, just right from across campus um, from the Aero Astro department. Juan, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I'll be glad to, and thanks for having me today. So my name is Juan Alonso. I'm a faculty member in the Aeronautics and Astronautics Department, which I think many of your students may or may not know. It's in the Duran building, so I'm not far from where you are or where you normally would be. I'm an aerospace engineer, so that means I'm interested in designing all kinds of flying and space vehicles, and most of my research is actually very focused on using uh, numerical techniques, uh, large computers, in order to understand the behavior of new proposed systems uh, and, and to make them better, right? So optimize them in various different ways such that they can become realistic products uh, 
I, I've been an academic for now 23 years. I think I've been at Stanford since 1997. So it's, it's been a while. Um, but I did take a few years off uh, to work in Washington, D.C., and I, I ran all the NASA uh, research programs for aeronautics. So it was a large, you know, almost $800 million a year program with 2,000 people and lots of headaches. But uh, in there, we were focusing on advanced vehicle configurations of different kinds. Uh, so much more environmentally compliant, more fuel efficient, new characteristics like supersonics, but also something that maybe is what uh, what brought us to this panel, John, uh, Laurie, and myself together. And that's that I'm very interested in the next generation of electric air taxis or, or uh, electric urban air mobility vehicles, as they are called, right? So my expertise in the panel is more in the airplanes and stuff like this as a means of transportation. So I, I feel a little bit like the odd man out here, but uh, but I'm very much looking forward to the conversation and trying to to tell you a little bit about why I think this new method of transportation is actually, well, has a chance of impacting what's going on. I, I've not been John an entrepreneur. Likes, John likes Sorry. stuff in the air too. Hyundai likes stuff in the air. Yes, he does, yes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was going to say, just to finish, I haven't been an entrepreneur in the past, but I did start a company just about eight months ago, and I'll be taking a two-year leave of absence uh, come the fall to pursue that more aggressively. So so I, I, I hope to, to take some from that experience to sort of bring back to our students and, and to understand the world from a slightly different vantage point. So pleasure to be here. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to start off with the question of what is your vision for the city of the future? How do you define this smart city, smart future that we have? And i um, very curious, um, anyone can start what your vision is for the future in that regard. Well, um, so I, I'll, I'll start on that one. So I, I think a part of it is um, that we can you know, continue to move around in our in our cities for for different reasons, um, but do it do it in a way that is I would call it eco friendly or environmentally sustainable. I think there's a lot of concern about the energy demand, even with automation, right? So even with autonomous cars, and maybe because of autonomous cars, the ease of which those vehicles can cause people for, to use mobility more will just drive up energy use, uh, whether it's electric or even combustion engine based. So I do hope that we, you know, just the concentration of activity, economic activity in cities means that you know, eco-friendliness is going to be a really, really uh, big deal. I also, the other vision is, it's a long-standing vision of, I think a lot of people in the automotive industry is uh, crash safety or as prevention of crashes. There are, you know, a lot of people getting injured or, or killed through through crashes, uh, both pedestrians as well as automotive and, and bicyclists and so on. So my vision is that we can find a way to reduce the death rate significantly, you know, beyond just having to work from home, right? Because right now it's safer now because there's fewer cars, right? So those two things, I think sustainability and, and then I think uh, safety and a reduction of crashes would be two, two, I think if we can achieve those two things, would be fantastic in a city of the future. I'll jump in. Um, I got excited about autonomous vehicles because um, uh, from a personal perspective in cities, well, first my parents got older and I really felt like they should not be driving <laughs> because they weren't driving very safely. So back to the safety point, I thought it was a little crazy um, that we allowed so many accidents to happen. You know, 1.4 million deaths every year that are avoidable, and then so many more crashes that occur all the time. And one thing that I was taught by one of the regulators of the National Highway Traffic Safety Association is never say an accident because it's not an accident, it's a crash. Uh, humans uh, are, are crashing into each other at a, uh, at a rapid pace. And so the safety aspect was critically important to me. The congestion, you know, getting stuck. I, I, I uh, traveled back and forth to China a number of times with Qualcomm and the congestion was astounding to me. And then of course the pollution are, is very, very important. The other thing that I think has got to be thought through though. That's for me, things that I care about. But I think if you look at a city serving all of its citizens, it's also about access. It's access to all the city services. It's the ability to interact with government on a much more friction-free way. It's better public transportation as well. And it's uh, allowing everyone in the city to move about easily. 
and to have access to services. So I care very much about that as well in that city of the future. So I, I'll just jump in to wrap up here. I, I strongly resonate with the things that are being said. I think sustainability in the future is just the key characteristic of cities that we have to pay much more attention to. And we have to figure out how to achieve sustainability, not starting with a blank sheet of paper, which is a rare opportunity that we get, but rather by following a path from where we have been. I'm not an urban planner, so I think you have to take what I say with a grain of salt. But uh, one thing that's always struck me, I, I don't know if your students are familiar with, there's, there's a United Nations UNICEF, a uh, very good uh, website that has projections until the year 2050 of the population of the world, total population, but also the distribution. And what is very clear is that the large cities that we have today are going to get larger. The amount of people that live in, in rural environments is going to decrease and the majority of those people are migrating into the cities. So when you start seeing cities that may have upwards of $20 million in many different places around the world, not just two or three places in the world as we have right now, um, you start uh, seeing that, that that time accurate path that we follow from where we are to where we need to be in the future at such large scale is going to be very, very challenging, right? So, so how, how do you give access to people? How do you make it uh, efficient and sustainable? How do you eliminate congestion? all of those things done safely, I, I think are critical. You've all said that. The, the aspect I'd like to bring in for not just within a big city and to the periphery of that big city, but also as these cities get larger, the distance between city centers is going to get somewhat smaller as well. Uh, uh, the transportation between these bigger city centers in order to maintain economic activity, level of development, so on and so forth is really important. So. So in addition to autonomy for the ground-based vehicles that, was, that were mentioned before, I really like to see whether it is possible, cost-effective and sustainable to have a component of air transportation that services the needs of transportation of these future cities. And that's something that we can talk a little bit more about if there is an interest, but uh, it's, it's a dimension that I'm, I'm personally interested in. So. So adding to that, we've definitely seen a lot of um, exciting startups and innovations emerge in the space of transportation and mobility. Would love to know more about what are some of the companies and initiatives you're backing, you're involved with, that you're particularly excited about? I'll start off with, so just to give a background about Hyundai Motor Company and really the group that we're a part of, Hyundai Motor Group, starting a Actually, we've been investing as a corporate venturing since about year 2000, but it wasn't really until 2017 or so that really started to pick up a lot you know by a lot i mean it's like 100x different than than before and and we decided that there were some five really key areas maybe six now but starting off with five you know smart mobility being one uh, smart cities robotics technologies uh, eco-friendly energy and artificial intelligence slash machine learning and then more recently really about smart factories so how do you how do you make things in a different way than, than they are today. And so there isn't really maybe necessarily any one company necessarily. It's, it's sort of like, I, I suppose when you're, when you're a venture, you know, even corporate investor that you, it's hard, you want, you're not supposed to have favorites, right? But that, that, that said though, I, I would say that the, the area that we really have put a lot of effort and, and time into would be in the mobility area. Uh, electrification, and then artificial intelligence slash machine learning. Over those areas, it's in the mobility area that we probably put the most in, and they really centered on two investments, one called Grab in Southeast Asia, and then Ola in, in India. And it's, be, it's really because we, we think, and I think others, you know, probably if you read you know, the, the press about how mobility services can really change and disrupt the needs for personal ownership, and this not only the U.S., but really worldwide. And then uh, electrification, of course, is really important. It's, it's certainly we have our own efforts, but it, it's, it's such a different, it's not just the technology, but how it's made, the use cases of electric vehicles is different than combustion engines. So really putting um, money into external firms, really focusing on that was important for us. And of course, machine learning is, you know, touching all kinds of industries and, and areas. So we put probably the highest number of our investments is in the AI machine learning uh, area. And I hope as, as Juan was talking about, 
um, the new area is the newest area will be urban air mobility. We'll be spending a lot more time in, in, in that area. So later on, maybe we can get into specifics, but I just want to give you kind of a broad brush overview of the where we're looking into and sort of highlights of, you know, in terms of money, where we put the most into so far. Great. Uh, I'll cover a couple of the playground portfolio companies. And then personally, Zooks is uh, looking at full stack autonomous mobility. So targeting that level five that I know was mentioned, both developing a novel vehicle architecture, as well as the software and sensor fusion algorithms to allow us to get there uh, in cities. So that's certainly one that I personally have been very involved in since it started. But in uh, uh, the playground portfolio, we took a different take to try to solve some other problems that folks weren't solving. So Notto is a company in our portfolio that was actually started by a, a Stanford professor by the name of Stefan Heck. Uh, so Notto was looking at distracted driving until we get to autonomy, there needed to be a way to monitor distracted drivers. And uh, he both started talking to insurance companies uh, about, hey, if we had some kind of camera in the vehicle, would that allow people to get lower insurance premiums? And where he really found traction was in fleets. So very large delivery fleets, for example. He found them both in ride hailing services, but now, as you can imagine, the delivery fleets are making up the majority of his business, but saying, let's make sure that there is a, the driver gets a warning, for example, if they've been looking down and if you've got sensors on the front of the vehicle that see that you're about to hit something, a camera inside could notice that the driver is not watching and warn them verbally. And then you can see the benefits of a driver who has that in their car might get some kind of uh, other benefits. So that's Notto. We also started a company called Lacuna uh, to work on actually developing an operating system for cities to manage all the different vehicles in a city working together with the cities to, for example, manage scooters, being able to see what's going on in the city and provide city services around all the different kinds of transportation in a city. So that's called Lacuna. Agility is a uh, robot that takes care of patch the last 10, the last 10 feet. You hear about the last mile. This is the last 10 feet of being able to carry a package out of, for example, an autonomous vehicle and then take it all the way to someone's front door without human interaction. That's called agility. Uh, out, some folks out of uh, Carnegie Mellon. And then we have a company called Fabric that's out of Israel that decided to do a full lights out fulfillment center for e-commerce. And they wanted to take advantage of the fact that underground parking lots, if less and less people are driving and parking and we're taking other forms of transportation, underground parking lots might be empty. And so why not turn that into a lights out fulfillment center in the middle of a city and then allow people to get their packages faster and have a, a fulfillment center. So that's called Fabric. And then the last one I'll mention is a, a drone company that is called Skydio, which has uh, the most accurate cameras on a drone. And they're finding a lot of interesting traction in construction, for example, going on in a city to be able to monitor how construction is uh, is moving forward. Mm -hmm. So those are a few very different different areas, but all related to a smarter city. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. It looks like um, Juan, a lot of folks are curious about your startup, which might be <laughs> your answer to the question in terms of what you're spending a lot of time focused on. Would you? Oh. Well, I, I first, yeah, I'm happy to say something, but uh, I think in general, uh, you know, in terms of things that our lab has been doing to help with the topic of discussion here, we, we've we've effectively helped, uh, I would say, five or six different companies, and most of them like to remain nameless uh, in terms of designing some of these uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. So, so I, I won't be able to say specifically, but I'll tell you there are there are about ten very serious companies in the Bay Area. And we've helped one in Germany, three here in the Bay Area, another one in the U.S., and one in Brazil look at uh, designs of these types of vehicles. And, and I think the challenges, uh, when I see some of the questions here in the chat window, the challenges for safety for the vehicles are, are you know, surprisingly a little bit uh, simpler than the challenges for safety for the ground vehicles themselves, because the sky is significantly big. And... 
there tends to be an extra level of infrastructure that allows these vehicles to sort of pass by each other without colliding. So, so in, in answering some of those questions of what would help uh, both the safety and the sustainability goals, I, I would say that the third dimension in the sky is a huge opportunity, right? Uh, not just for mm -hmm. congestion, but for safety. I would also say for sustainability, obviously all these vehicles, I, I would say the vast majority of the vehicles we've worked on are completely electrified, so they're battery powered. That limits the range to, you know, in the order of 100 nautical miles, which is not a terribly large range, but it's enough for intercity, sorry, intra-city uh, type of transportation. We've been advising and, and <coughs> helping uh, a company that is actually designing one such vehicle, but for longer distances. And those are hybrid electric uh, vehicles that we've dealt with. Last but not least, uh, the company I'm spending a lot of time in that I'm a co-founder for has very little to do with this. I, I do a lot of numerical analysis and optimization. So it's a company that it's really trying to revolutionize the way we do engineering design based on simulations. And I, I can't say a lot, but you could imagine there's a, a component of using existing computers much more effectively. So being 100 times faster. And there's also a component of, of doing silicon solutions uh, for these types of engineering design tasks uh, which which could be not one to two orders of magnitude faster than what people are doing now but three to three and a half orders of magnitude so so we're trying to accelerate design processes by writing a lot of software and creating custom-made hardware so, yeah um, so uh, focusing more on the topic of autonomous mobility specifically um, could you elaborate on the benefits of autonomous vehicles for cities of the future? And also, similarly, what are the unforeseen negative effects we might see in cities due to these autonomous systems? Do you want me to start or you want, to, John, you want to take it? Either way. Uh, Laurie, why don't you get started? And I'll <laughs> jump in, yeah. You know, I think we all, the problem right now is we all imagine what the future would look like with autonomous vehicles. And so no one knows. Now that doesn't say we should just unleash the beast, but there are a number of things to think about when you think about how these will be accepted and how they should be accepted. And uh, when we started Zooks, we started meeting with government officials at the federal, state, and local level to talk about what were the things we might not be thinking about that were going to be important to them so that uh, we could be thinking of it. Because a lot of people say, oh no, with autonomous vehicles, there's going to actually be more vehicle traffic. Well, it kind of depends on supply. It kind of depends on if people use it versus ride hailing or if they're just more vehicles in a city. It's really, it's really hard to, to make those kinds of projections right now because autonomous vehicles are going to have very expensive sensors and software in there. So they're going to be very expensive to produce for the most part. You know, the reason electric vehicles didn't go forward as quickly is they were more expensive. Adding battery packs to a vehicle envelope made them more expensive. And so you have a cost situation. So a lot of this, these concerns that a city is going to be swarmed by autonomous vehicles, which will cause more congestion, I think is just a false projection. So I, I got to start there. So my hope is that it will make cities uh, safer and that it will avoid uh, many of those crashes that I talked about because an autonomous vehicle has eyes in the back of its head and, you know, has a 360 degree view and doesn't really need to park. So there can be a lot of benefits. However, uh, one of the issues that has come up in this space that you have to be careful of is there were a lot of companies that tried to rush something to market to be first. There is this concept that you have to be first to be cool. And so getting a vehicle out where, as I talked about, you're duct taping a bunch of sensors to the hood of a car and unleashing the beast with some software that's been tested in a beta version is not a safe way. So that autonomous vehicle unleashed in a city thank you, I don't want it, I'll move to another city. But ones that are rolled out very carefully in conjunction with the city is a different story. So, uh, you know, very, very different. And we've seen that in, in scooters, we've seen that in share, ride share vehicles. In some cases, these have been rolled out in conjunction with the city. And in some cases, they've been rolled out to use consumers or citizens in a city as, as uh, alpha testers and beta testers. And so I, I think you got to be careful not to get those concepts confused. I think Ernestine, did that answer what the question was? Yeah, 
Yes. So, I'll let, so actually, I'll let Sean speak first. Yeah. So I'm going to do a counterpoint to what Lori just said. So my counterpoint is on the congestion issue. And, and I don't, I think it's possible, as Lori said, that we won't have a congestion issue or that is more vehicles on the road. But I think we have to be intentional about that. I think if we just let it be, I, I do think that we would have more vehicles on the road of different types, not just passenger vehicles, but maybe you know, Tom's delivery vehicles. And there's, there's sort of two historical things that we can now see that, for me, at least that leads to that conclusion, or at least, at least possibility. One is just Lyft and, Lyft and Uber. Uh, we know that, uh, or I, I've definitely heard that uh, the traffic has increased in the San Francisco Bay Area because of Lyft and Uber, right? Because now it's easier for you know, me to, to travel to San Francisco because I don't have to dread the drive. Right, and the convenience is pretty awesome, right? So why not? Why not go to San Francisco more often? And and I think there's been an increase in traffic overall, and not maybe every city, but certainly San Francisco. I think even New York ha has seen this. The other historical uh, issue has, or fact is really from the mobile phone industry. When you have better connectivity, you know, two G, three G, four G, now five G and people not talk talking about 6G for heaven's sakes, then does internet traffic go up or down? It goes up. Why? Because it's faster, it's convenient, there's more stuff. So if I put that together, if automated vehicles is a technology play, and it may not be, but if it is, then we could run into the problem that it induces more demand, demand drives up these vehicles, and then we have more congestion. But I do think if we, have to, if we design it properly, we won't run into the issue of increased congestion. But it has to be designed, in my viewpoint. Uh, this is a, so I, I do a lot of parallel computation, and this is an analogy. I mean, the, what you're describing is a situation in which the efficiency of the system has gone up, but the sheer volume of how many customers are actually being served has gone up as well. And the gains in efficiency have not kept up with the increase in traffic, therefore leading to more congestion, right? So, so the, the, the issue is also what additional levers do we have to continue to improve on the levels of efficiency with which this service is being provided to the citizens of a city and at the same time, you know, maintain the level of congestion or reduce it, right? So I, I wish uh, my colleague Marco Pavone would be there because he's been studying some of these transportation patterns in various cities of the size of New York, the impact that some of these ride sharing services have actually had and the absolute potential of what could be done with a fleet of the size that can service and increase demand but at the same time do so even more efficiently than we do today and, and, and maintain congestion levels. So I'm hoping that the cities of the future really do manage this growth by improving efficiency in that way and that they incorporate the technology that's necessary to be able to do it because left to its own devices as you're saying John I think it's highly unlikely that uh, the outcome is going to be one where there is reduced congestion and additional services being provided. I think, but I think the important thing is not to conflate different concepts. So there's ride sharing vehicles, which basically became a cheaper taxi, right? A better taxi experience. And that's Lyft and Uber. That is not autonomous in any way. And so I think sometimes people say, oh, autonomous vehicles are going to cause congestion because Lyft and Uber have, but that's just more taxis at a better cost. So as you talked about, taxis became more cost effective, a la Lyft and Uber and Didi and Chariot and all the others that came out. But that was a price play. Now you look at, if I look on my street now, when I go bike riding in the afternoon, the only thing that's there is delivery vehicles. And you have UPS and you have FedEx and because people are buying a lot more stuff in boxes and getting them delivered to them. So again, nothing to do with autonomy. Right now, we're seeing a huge amount of delivery vehicles because delivery's gone to free. So it's an economic case. People will use things that are less expensive, um, you know, basics of economics so, and supply and Gloria, demand. Autonomy, I, I, has, autonomy has nothing to do with either of those. What, what I was going to say is that I think autonomy is a great opportunity to increase that level of efficiency, right? So if instead of having just the replacement seats, you start having uh, you know, fleets of cars that can self-organize and can actually deliver people to various different places in, in different ways. I think it's one of the levers you must exploit, right? And not just to look at a single vehicle by itself, but to look at the set of vehicles trying to 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 do this in the optimal way in some senses. So completely agree with you. We can't just replace more cars by cars that are, you know, being called through and out.
<laughs> by cheaper, cheaper rides, yes. So we have talked a little bit about congestion, safety, and now also pricing. What do you think is government's role? Like what should government be playing in this? Um, specifically, we have seen um, a few regions where they have started to allow for the testing of autonomous vehicles in the future where we eventually get to level five autonomy, also internet of cars. Like how do you think government should be reacting to this? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'll let you guys think. <laughs> so I, I think government plays uh, an incredibly important role because it's not, not one any particular institution or, or agency. It's really, to borrow a phrase from the pandemic, we're all in this together, right? It's, it's not any one entity that's going to make it. And it's both the public-private partnerships that have to be reimagined, uh, but it's also going to be the public-public partnerships that have to be reimagined. Because in any region, if you will, the San Francisco Bay Area, LA area, whatever, it's, you have multiple jurisdictions, which is why sometimes transportation projects are next to impossible to make system-wide because you have competing jurisdictions. That's why BART, for instance, I guess, doesn't go around the Bay, even though it's called the Bay Area Rapid Transit, it's only part of the Bay, right? It's only half, half BART, I guess. So, so I think for this to work, government is gonna to have to be um, themselves, the, the institutions at all levels, city, county, regional, state, federal. There's gonna have to be some kind of coordination to, I guess, reduce, that, that each will have a role to play for sure, right? And they'll all wanna have a role to play. They all have their own levels of responsibilities and constituents they have to be accountable to. And then between the private sector and, and public, that has to be reimagined too. And by that, what I mean by that is, for instance, can we rethink about how we do public-private partnerships, you know, in a way that seems to be sometimes antagonistic, right? Or it's sort of like, uh, I'm going to not ask for permission, I'm going to do it, and then I'll beg for forgiveness kind of thing, right? I think we have to, you know, I hope get beyond that you know, seriously, and really find a way for companies and, and, and government. And I, I know companies have been doing, not, not all companies are bad actors, right? But, but I think let's do a better job of that so that, right, so, that, so these things that government can do uh, at all levels and companies can do work better because, again, we're all in this together, right? And, and so let's try to work together to make it happen. Um, I've spent a huge amount of time talking to government leaders about smart cities and urban mobilities for the last decade, but a, a ton at Zooks. One of our first hires was the ex-head of the National Highway Traffic Safety Association, Dr. Mark Rosekind, who's an incredible expert on the subject, was at Stanford before, another Stanford guy. And uh, he came in and said, we have to look at every level. First, while he was in the federal government in Washington, D.C., he's the one, the way we met him is we're a 10-person startup. He flew out to Silicon Valley and said, I want to meet with the companies who are going to be leading this autonomous revolution that's coming forth. So I'm here to get educated because the last thing I want to do is stop the progress because these are going to hopefully make cities much safer, much cleaner, with lower congestion if done correctly. So, you know, he said the last thing I want to do is pass new regulations that stop the flow of innovation, which was incredible. You don't think about the federal government coming out saying, I want to learn from innovators. And, you know, earlier in my career, the thought was, hey, stay, you know, work on whatever, whatever product you're working on. Don't waste your time with government. They're slow. They're going to lag 10 years. Don't even think about it. And in this case, he said, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be asked to do this. And so I need to, I need to be able to meet with you. And so we worked with him very uh, closely for about a year. And he liked the company so much that when his term was up in the previous administration, he came and joined Zooks full time. And then he decided he wanted to raise the bar for safety and set uh, an, a new record for security and say, hey, our goal is going to be zero crashes. So it's not we're going to be slightly better than human drivers we're going to be, we're going to have zero crashes. So what are all the safety systems we need to build and how would we need to architect the system to ensure that we could get to zero crashes? And then, and then is miles driven really the best indicator of whether a software system is ready? No, all miles are not created equal. I can drive miles in a, a, on a country road and I may drive a million of them, but I don't see a lot of pedestrians like I do in a crazy city. So is that really the best indicator of a safe system of technological progress? 
So he started talking to regular regulators saying, hey, you shouldn't be judging based on miles driven. Then we even got down to the local law enforcement guys because what happens if an autonomous vehicle is misbehaving? How would local law enforcement want to deal with that? And so we started having sessions with them talking about how do first responders work and how would they like to work with an autonomous vehicle? So uh, but that's the U.S. Outside the U.S., the Singaporean government, of course, uh, has come up with some autonomous-only cities and areas. They're looking at underground highways that are all autonomous. You know, they're able to really have a, a much bigger say on how they architect a transportation s system in Singapore. In China, of course, there's been a huge push towards moving towards autonomy, working with the large internet providers. Japan is very concerned of their aging population, so there is a ton of government interest. Uh, I would say Europe less so. I think uh, the U.S. and Asia will really drive this forward, but I have found the U.S. regulators to be pretty tremendous, actually, in wanting to work with companies to ensure that they don't put in place regulation that is uh, untenable. If I, if I may, I, I wanted to riff a little bit on that theme of efficiency with what uh, Laurie and John have just said recently. And if one focuses too much on just one aspect of transportation in the future city, you're actually missing the big picture because, you know, in improving efficiency, not everybody's going to be driving around with one or another by themselves or with another people in a driverless car. And that's the solution. There are obviously public transportation challenges. There's uh, this element of multimodality. Maybe there'll be some airplanes in the mix, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I guess I wanted to ask my co-panelists to know a lot more than I do about this, is that if you start looking at various different transportation options for you know, 20 million people in, a, in an urban area, and, and you really look at multimodality, how, how can autonomy begin to help us improve the efficiency of the entire system, right? And the safety, of course, obviously. I, I think the, the zero accident goal is, is the, the right one, right? But, but is, there, is there a way to improve the infrastructure in cities such that the multimodal transportation systems that are most likely to be successful can actually be successful, right? That, that's the question I'm asking myself, and I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is. So I'll, I'll take a, I'll bite on that one. <laughs> I think autonomy, the definition of it for me is that it's a systems quality, not a, a system of the agent, right? And so when describing autonomy, you have to look at the agent plus the environment by which it is operating in or designed to operate in. And, and, and you can't have a full definition of autonomy without that. And I think sometimes autonomous vehicles, we get, there's some discussion, but I think we might lose sight of that. And so this is maybe not the best example, but I do think, you know, things like elevators are a type of autonomous vehicle. I think amusement park rides are part of an um, autonomous vehicle. So, you know, one could say, okay, they're primitive, but they're kind of autonomous in, in a sense. So on the issue of infrastructure, I think it's critical. I think you have to include discussion of what is infrastructure to make it work and then infrastructure is pretty broad, right? It's, it's um, how we design streets, it's how we design the, 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 the interaction between vehicles and people and those types of things. So in short, yeah, I think without an adequate discussion of infrastructure, uh, which is a topic that government can provide or be responsible for, then I think it's difficult to, to have a, a really good working multimodal transportation system. I think it's been interesting meeting with different uh, city planners and uh, right before the shutdown, I happened to be up in Seattle meeting with the head of the Seattle Department of Transportation as they were trying to figure out what their needs were. And I think you have to start with the goals of your city because uh, as we know, Singapore is one of the few places that can start with a blank sheet and build whatever they want to build. In other cities, we have to take into account what's working, what's not, what stuff can we move and what stuff can't we. You know, I think it's interesting in the Bay Area, you know, we have our high-speed train discussion on the ballot most years, but there are a lot of uh, dislocations that would, would occur, and so it's been put back. And so I think every city planner has to sit down and say, what are the goals? And as you know, in government, you have to ask your citizens and they have to sign off on that bond measure or decide that that's the right thing to spend money on and that's the right problem to solve. So 
I think transportation is one piece because you've also got healthcare and education and homelessness and all the other things. And so as a city planner, you have to say, what am I solving with transportation? And in Seattle's case, they kept reiterating, we've got to let anyone get to their job in a cost-effective manner. Well, that's going to be very different than, you know, you may want to make sure that there are scooters and bikes and buses in every route. And it may be, I mean, they couldn't care less about autonomy right now if they're not solving the problem. So, you know, what, what problem am I trying to solve? What's working and what's not working? Because I have an existing city. And take a look at certainly what others are doing, but I met with city leaders from the Middle East who are trying to create whole new cities from scratch who have very different constraints and needs for efficiency and needs for uh, the population. So, but it's interesting. Um, and I think the Seattle DOT has it on its website. I saw the presentation given and it was pretty interesting in terms of what their goals were. It wouldn't be the same goals as every other city. Mm -hmm. Um, Lori, you alluded to very briefly just this idea of accessibility and affordability is a little bit of what I was hearing um, from you. Question for everyone is, um, how do you think about user trust and adoption being a barrier to deploying autonomous mobility in smart cities? I, I think it's a big deal. It, you know, I think it's somewhat easy to gain in, in my view, but if, you, if there is a problem, then it's, easy, it's hard to, to gain, get back. I do think the COVID-19 pandemic is like that in the sense that how, when will we feel safe getting back into large groups, right? And it's and before it was a no-brainer, but maybe we'll be thinking about it a little bit more carefully when the sheltering place order is lifted, we're going to be a more careful. So I, I think the trust is going to be important because then trust involves things like uh, public support, right? Supporting bond measures, taxes, uh, et cetera, to allow these systems to, to, you know, get the, either the funding or the regulatory environment to be, be favorable. So I think trust is um, exceedingly important. I think this is a huge issue. If I said that I'm going to send an airplane to come outside of your house, pick you up and take you <laughs> to San Francisco, in 25 minutes and from San Jose, let's say, instead of taking you an hour and 45 minutes during rush hour, you know, please raise your hand if you would actually get on that airplane tomorrow. What if I change that around uh, uh, and I, I actually ask you if an autonomous car came to your house in San Jose and it, took, it said it was going to take you to San Francisco to your destination, how many of you would take that today? So trust is a humongous issue. And, and it's, it's also an issue that will get easier when we have a, an entire fleet that's autonomous in some utopical future when that happens. But in the meanwhile, uh, where the guarantee of safety cannot be provided by even the perfect uh, sensor endowed autonomous system, right? Uh, John may come in and drive from the side, and even with a 360-degree thing, it may be an area that he's not visible at the speed he's traveling at to actually hit me. So, so let's be honest. You cannot guarantee to me today that an autonomous vehicle is going to be perfectly safe in a mixed environment with other people. In a longer future, it may. So we have to accumulate that uh, sort of experience that leads to societal change. And this comes from a guy who got up into one of these autonomous airplanes that take off and land vertically in China about a year ago. But uh, um, I, I, you know, I don't know that I would do it myself either today. So, so trust is, is fundamental. And as John said, it develops slowly and it can be lost in a flash. So we have to manage that. And I think there's a, a corporate and social responsibility to migrate in the desired direction at a reasonable pace. So. You have to take it into account, but you know, I got into the first uh, Google prototype in 2006, I think, and going at uh, like 80 miles an hour around cones. And it was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life, but it was totally fun. And of course, I never, I didn't give it a second thought before I got into the vehicle. So for me, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of issue. I remember when Uber, right when Uber came out in LA, I was traveling with a friend who said, oh, there's this cool new app I just downloaded and you're supposed to be able to call a taxi. And I didn't have to sit down and read a training manual on Uber before I took my first one. And once I took yeah. my first one, it was like, so I, I think sometimes we overestimate. You're right. The mass majority of the population, I will pick on my family members. But when I tried to explain the concept of Uber to my sisters and ones in Canada where they don't have it, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> but again, uh, 
it really depends. And if we need to get 100% of the mass market or do we need to get some percentage who are willing to try something new is, uh, is what we get to do here. And again, I think we're going to be supply constrained. So I don't see that as a gating issue. Do you need to make sure consumers feel comfortable? Absolutely. Do you need to make, regu make sure regulators feel comfortable? Absolutely. But you have time to roll it out. Nobody says we're going to go, we're going to do this quick changeover from all of today's vehicles to autonomous vehicles next year. It's going to be this massive changeover of the whole planet. You know, that is not the integration plan. And I think, you know, as you looked with ride sharing, it was the same thing. And scooters, it was the same thing. It's not a changeover. It's the multimodality that you talked about. And some consumers also don't get on a scooter because they think they're scary and unsafe. So uh, I think the great thing is consumers will choose what kind of transportation they want to take. One final question I have, what is a realistic timeline for the implementation of autonomous vehicles in the U.S.? It seems like there's a lot of people who constantly say two to three years away every few months or every for the past few years. I do want to distinguish between the different levels of autonomy um, when you do provide that response and would be curious on what your thoughts are. Yeah, this, this, I think there's, if, if the question is, if the sense of it is mass presence, I do think that is too far away to say, right? To, with any degree of, for me, certainty. If you were to say, well, what about in a neighborhood? Well, we kind of know that's already happening with Waymo. So I, I think that for me, the, the question of when there'll be a mass service that is readily available for a lot of people, generally speaking, to me, the answer is too far away to say with any, it would be a speculation, not even an educated guess in my, my viewpoint. But if it's like, hey, in, my, in Stanford campus, yeah, I think it could be this year, actually, right? You could do it this year, right? Because for a lot of different reasons. So as I think, and I believe, so therefore, I believe the way we roll out is we'll have kind of this very micro or very constrained geographic areas where these things can operate. And I think that is good. You, you'll develop trust and you'll develop experience on all sides. Everybody gets familiar and then it'll just grow to borrow <laughs> virally, right? It'll grow virally and we know virally it can be really effective, right? So you start small and you just kind of grow it to some mass point at some point in the future, which would be just pure speculation to me at this point. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, you have to look at, is the technology ready? and in what circumstances and then you have to look at are the regulators ready and are the consumers ready and has is the city ready right and so you know when will level five be ready uh, from a strict technology perspective if you don't all have the levels memorized level five is you know can work anywhere that a car can work under all weather conditions i don't think that's actually the right question i think you have to look at where is our technology readiness where is our city reception and where do consumers want it and the technology is very hard. It's, there's a lot to build in the software, again, to be able to handle all conditions and not just the use case for, for, for example, delivery vehicles in non-crowded places. Or someone else asked about trucks. Long-haul trucking's an easier problem to solve because there are a number of schemes where, you know, while the driver is sleeping on the highway, autonomy could take over, much like autopilot in planes. You know, this concept of autopilot when somebody needs some shut up or needs is distracted. You know, highways are pretty straight. You tend not to have dogs, cats, and rodents uh, cruising around and people in crosswalks. So highways, some would argue, is a, is a safer use case. So I think it's, it's hard to say when will it be ready everywhere. And, you know, the question is, do we really want all cities to go autonomous everywhere? I still ride my bike on the weekends. I'm not going to take an autonomous vehicle on the weekends. I, you know, I take different transportation based on what I want to take. And again, I think the supply, you can't forget about the supply limitation. There is not this world where cities suddenly become all autonomous, with the exception of perhaps Singapore wanting to do that or somewhere in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't think in the U.S. we're going to suddenly see autonomous cities, except for theme parks. One could argue today theme parks have rides that go around and take you around and their little trains and their sky rides. And, you know, you see that in theme parks. But uh, and I think on campuses, you're already seeing autonomous vehicles that are cruising around, either delivering people's mail or or giving people a ride from one end of the campus to the other. Juan, do you have any crystal ball insights to that? <laughs> 
No, I'm not an autonomous vehicle person, but, but what really strikes me is that the environments in which these vehicles operate uh, are going to dictate the level of safety that you can guarantee. And therefore, it's going to be a sort of an incremental from simpler as they were being, as it was being said, to more difficult. There is no question that, you know, getting in a Waymo car in a test track with a bunch of cones at whatever speed is, is quite a bit simpler than getting into, you know, Rome at 4 p.m. with pedestrians and people driving like crazy, right, in different cities. <laughs> So I think the environment, the conditions and everything else plays a role. And I think we'll see, you know, sort of progressive introduction in, in, in simpler settings first and more complicated later on while we build a database of knowledge, safety, guarantees, so on and so forth. But I, I was hoping to have something. I, I'm still hoping by the time I cannot drive anymore and Lori wants to take my license away, uh, I will be able to have an autonomous vehicle that takes me wherever I want to go. So. <laughs>